it comes to maintaining homeostasis, the kidneys may be the body's most important organs. That's why kidney or renal failure so easily upsets the body's chemical balance, sometimes with deadly consequences. As you know, renal failure can be temporary or permanent. It occurs when kidney structures are damaged by a congenital disorder, an acute or chronic condition such as cardiogenic shock or hypertension, or a nephrotoxic substance such as an antibiotic. Now let's see how that knowledge applies to your patient who's receiving an antibiotic for cellulitis. As you review his laboratory test results, you notice that his blood urea nitrogen and creatinine levels have increased dramatically. And when checking his current drug list, you think that the aminoglycoside, gentamicin, may be the cause. But are you confident that you can spot the factors that place your patient at risk for renal failure? Do you know how the disorder produces its signs, symptoms, and complications? And can you tell what effects your interventions are likely to have? This video will answer all these questions. It will clearly explain the pathophysiology of acute and chronic renal failure, show you how to identify the disorders, and demonstrate ways to treat them and prevent their complications. Acute renal failure occurs when a disorder or nephrotoxic substance damages the kidneys or interferes with kidney function. To understand renal failure, first remember how the kidneys normally function. The kidneys flank the spine in the lumbar area. Each one contains millions of urine-producing units called nephrons. Each nephron contains a glomerulus, its main filter, and a tubular system composed of proximal and distal convoluted tubules and the loop of Henle. This U-shaped tubule, which has descending and ascending limbs, concentrates urine. From the blood, nephrons filter water, electrolytes such as potassium and sodium, and toxins such as urea. Then they excrete these substances as urine. Here's how the process works. Through the renal arteries and their branches, the kidneys receive about one and a quarter liters of blood from the heart every minute. From the renal arteries, the afferent arterioles carry unfiltered blood to the glomerular capillaries where it's filtered. Then it moves through the efferent arterioles into the peritubular capillaries. After urine is formed through glomerular filtration and tubular reabsorption and secretion, it enters the collecting tubule. Eventually, urine moves to the ureters. These muscular tubes transport urine to the bladder, where it's stored until it's expelled through the urethra during urination. Acute renal failure may be pre-renal, intrarenal, or post-renal. Each type of renal failure is produced by a problem in a different part of the renal system. In pre-renal failure, blood flow to the kidneys is reduced or interrupted. This typically occurs when cardiac output falls below normal, such as in heart failure. When blood flow is reduced, the kidneys try to compensate by releasing renin. This hormone triggers the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 in the lungs and kidneys and the secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Together, these substances constrict the arteries and raise intravascular volume, which raises the blood pressure and improves blood flow to the kidneys. However, if this compensation isn't sufficient, blood flow to the kidneys eventually decreases and may cause ischemia. When blood flow is decreased, the glomeruli can't filter blood efficiently, which reduces the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. 
When the GFR drops, creatinine, urea, and other toxins build up in the blood, causing azotemia. In the tubular system, ischemia damages the epithelial lining, causing it to slough off in a syndrome known as acute tubular necrosis, or ATN. In intrarenal failure, the tubules and other renal structures are damaged directly, which often results in ATN. The damage may be caused by a disorder, such as glomerulonephritis, or a nephrotoxic substance. These substances include antibiotics, immunosuppressants, heavy metals, and contrast media. In this patient with ATN, the aminoglycoside, gentamicin, uniformly damaged the epithelial layer of the proximal tubule in the loop of Henle. Then, the damaged epithelium let the filtered toxins, or filtrate, leak back into the blood, causing azotemia. In post-renal failure, urine flow from the kidneys is obstructed in the ureters, bladder, or urethra. Typically, this form of renal failure results from renal calculi, blood clots, tumors, or an enlarged prostate gland. The obstruction causes pressure to build behind it, which raises the pressure in the glomeruli. This leads to glomerular dysfunction, reducing the GFR and causing azotemia. If you suspect acute renal failure, work quickly to assess your patient so you can pinpoint its cause and begin treatment. Your assessment findings may vary with the phase of acute renal failure. If your patient's in the oliguric phase, expect his urine output to fall sharply. Normally, urine output exceeds 30 milliliters per hour. In the oliguric phase, it drops to about 15 milliliters per hour. This decreased urine output usually occurs one to seven days after the causative event. If the patient has severe tubular injury, he may develop a urea with a urine output of less than 50 milliliters in 24 hours. Urine output can fall because less blood circulates to the kidneys to be filtered. Or it can fall because damaged tubular epithelial cells collect and obstruct the tubules. When your patient's urine output is low, look for signs of intravascular fluid overload. First, measure his blood pressure, which may be high. Next, look for signs of heart failure caused by fluid overload. These signs include an S3 heart sound, pulmonary crackles, and jugular vein distension. Also assess for peripheral and central edema. They develop when intravascular fluid leaks into the interstitial space. Now observe your patient's breathing. He may have Kussmaul's respirations, which are rapid, deep breaths caused by metabolic acidosis. This complication occurs because the damaged tubular epithelial cells lose their ability to synthesize ammonia, or NH3. Normally, ammonia combines with hydrogen ions to form ammonium, or NH4, which is excreted in the urine. By promoting hydrogen ion excretion, ammonia helps maintain a normal blood pH. Without ammonia, hydrogen ions accumulate in the blood, lowering the pH. At first, bicarbonate, or HCO3, maintains a normal pH by combining with the hydrogen to form carbonic acid, or H2CO3. Then, carbonic acid breaks down into carbon dioxide, or CO2, and water, or H2O. Eventually, the bicarbonate supply is exhausted, and the damaged tubules prevent the formation of new bicarbonate. This results in hydrogen ion buildup and acidosis. To raise the pH, the body must remove more acid. So it tries to exhale extra carbon dioxide, which is a weak acid. And this produces the characteristic 
Kussmaul's respirations. Next, assess for neurologic effects, such as lethargy or confusion. These findings may occur when unexcreted urea and creatinine build up in the blood and produce toxic effects on the central nervous system. If your patient's in the diuretic phase of acute renal failure, you're likely to see his urine output exceed 400 milliliters per hour. In this phase, urine output increases because the glomeruli filter the blood, but the tubules can't concentrate the urine. Urine output also rises because of osmotic diuresis, which is caused by a high blood urea nitrogen, or BUN, level. Because diuresis characterizes this phase, assess for signs of fluid and electrolyte depletion. For example, check for dry skin and mucous membranes, and for arrhythmias. Arrhythmias may result from an electrolyte imbalance, such as hypokalemia. In the diuretic phase, large amounts of potassium and sodium are excreted in the urine. So hypokalemia and hyponatremia are especially likely to occur. And these electrolyte imbalances may trigger abnormal automaticity, causing an arrhythmia. If your patient's in the recovery phase, expect his urine output to gradually return to normal. This phase reflects tubule healing. It usually begins three to four weeks after the injury and can last for six months to a year. After assessing your patient, prepare him for diagnostic tests as ordered. First, obtain blood samples and urine specimens for testing. When the test results are ready, review them closely. In the oliguric phase of acute renal failure caused by ATN, expect to find a blood sodium level below 135 milliequivalents per liter, indicating hyponatremia. A blood potassium level above 4.5 milliequivalents per liter, indicating hyperkalemia. A BUN level above 20 milligrams per deciliter, and a creatinine level above 1.2 milligrams per deciliter, indicating azotemia. In the diuretic phase, watch for the blood potassium level to fall, as potassium is excreted in the urine. Expect urine tests to reveal low osmolality of dilute urine, indicating the tubule's inability to concentrate urine. An elevated sodium level, reflecting sodium loss in urine. And sediment that contains red blood cells and casts, reflecting blood cell leakage through damaged glomeruli and tubules. Also, anticipate finding protein in the urine. Proteinuria occurs when damaged glomerular capillaries let large protein molecules pass through to the urine. If the cause of renal failure is unknown, prepare your patient for other tests, such as a renal scan. During a renal scan, a radioisotope is injected into the blood. Then the kidneys are visualized through a scanner. A renal scan may show abnormal kidney structures, which may occur in renal infarction. Abnormal perfusion, which may occur in renal artery atherosclerosis. Or abnormal excretory function, which may occur in ATN. After acute renal failure is confirmed, provide treatment based on its cause. For a patient like this one, immediately discontinue the nephrotoxic drug, gentamicin, as prescribed, and expect to replace it with a less nephrotoxic antibiotic, such as ceftazidine. If prescribed, administer a loop diuretic, such as furosemide, Loop diuretics increase water and sodium excretion, which helps relieve intravascular fluid overload. Also anticipate administering a low dose of intravenous dopamine. This drug dilates the renal arteries, which increases blood flow to the kidneys. If your patient has fluid overload and hyperkalemia, you may arrange for hemodialysis. 
In hemodialysis, blood is filtered through a dialyzer, which contains a semi-permeable membrane. The membrane lets substances, such as urea, creatinine, potassium, and phosphate, diffuse through so they can be removed from the blood. Now suppose you're caring for this patient. She developed chronic renal failure because her hypertension was undiagnosed and untreated. Chronic renal failure results from progressive, irreversible loss of kidney function. It has several causes. It can be produced by any disorder that permanently damages part of the nephrons, such as hypertension, diabetes mellitus, or glomerulonephritis. For this patient with hypertension, chronic renal failure probably resulted from the sustained elevation of systemic arterial pressure. This high blood pressure raises the pressure in the glomerular capillaries and increases blood flow through the glomeruli. Over time, the increased blood pressure and blood volume cause inflammation and fibrosis in one or more glomeruli. Because these damaged glomeruli can't filter urea and other toxins, the remaining nephrons must work harder to filter blood. Then, these overwork nephrons enlarge and eventually fail. In most cases, renal function declines gradually. Generally, the GFR is unaffected until more than 75% of the nephrons are damaged. When only 25% of the nephrons are functioning, the patient has renal insufficiency. At this stage, the BUN and creatinine levels begin to rise above normal. As renal failure progresses, the BUN level rises, producing uremic symptoms, such as weakness and nausea. When only 10% of the nephrons are functioning, end-stage renal failure occurs. If you're caring for a patient with chronic renal failure, be sure to perform a complete and accurate assessment because this disorder can affect most body systems and cause many complications. First, observe for a decreased level of consciousness or alertness, which may reflect a neurologic complication. In chronic renal failure, uremic toxin buildup depresses the central nervous system producing such symptoms as lethargy, weakness, and confusion. Now measure your patient's blood pressure. Expect the reading to be higher than normal. Because chronic renal failure causes sodium and water retention, it increases the blood volume and leads to fluid overload. This, in turn, raises the pressure on the arterial walls and the blood pressure. Chronic renal failure also increases blood pressure by activating the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. This system triggers vasoconstriction and sodium and water retention, which raises the blood pressure. Next, evaluate the patient's respiratory rate, depth, and effort. Be alert for Kussmaul's respirations, which are caused by metabolic acidosis. Also look for labored respirations. These respirations develop when fluid overload and hypoalbuminemia lead to fluid collection in the lungs. When the glomerular capillaries are damaged, albumin and other plasma proteins can pass through them and be excreted in the urine. This lowers the blood albumin level. With less albumin in the blood, the intravascular oncotic pressure falls below the interstitial oncotic pressure. This forces fluid into the interstitial spaces, such as the alveoli and pleura. So listen for pulmonary crackles, which are created by air moving through fluid-filled alveoli. If fluid accumulates in the pleura, you may hear diminished breath sounds caused by pleural effusion. You may also note a pleural friction rub, which is a coarse squeaking or grating sound that occurs late in inspiration or early in expiration. This adventitious breath sound occurs when fluid with uremic toxins accumulates in the pleura. 
these toxins inflame the lungs' visceral and parietal pleura. When the inflamed pleural surfaces rub together during respiration, the characteristic rubbing sound occurs. Uremic toxins can also inflame the heart's pericardial layers, resulting in pericarditis. If you suspect pericarditis, listen for a two or three component pericardial friction rub. This rub is heard when the inflamed pericardial surfaces slide over each other. Next, assess your patient's skin. You're likely to detect pruritus, which occurs when chronic uremia damages the cutaneous nerve endings. This causes intense itching. You may also see uremic frost, a white crystal-like coating on the skin. Uremic frost occurs when urea and other metabolic wastes pass through capillary walls and are deposited on the skin with perspiration. You may observe pallor caused by anemia. This disorder commonly occurs because chronic renal failure reduces the production of erythropoietin, which is formed in the kidney's peritubular interstitial cells. Normally, erythropoietin stimulates and regulates red cell production in the blood. In chronic renal failure, the kidneys lose their ability to produce erythropoietin, so red blood cell production declines. What's more, uremic toxins in the blood decrease the red blood cell's lifespan, causing them to die sooner than normal. Because uremic toxins can also inflame the gastrointestinal mucosa, assess for signs of GI complications. To do this, ask about anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Also inspect the oral mucosa for ulcerations, which occur when inflammation progresses to erosion. After examining your patient, prepare her for diagnostic tests. When the results are available, review them closely. For your patient with chronic renal failure, blood tests are likely to reveal high levels of uremic toxins, such as BUN and creatinine. They also may show severe electrolyte imbalances, including hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypermagnesemia. These imbalances occur because the kidneys can't excrete potassium, phosphate, and magnesium in the urine. Surprisingly, test results may point to hypocalcemia and hyponatremia. Hypocalcemia occurs because the kidneys can't activate vitamin D. Normally, the GI tract requires activated vitamin D for calcium absorption. Hyponatremia occurs because the blood retains sodium, which attracts water. The extra water dilutes the blood, producing a false low blood sodium level, known as dilutional hyponatremia. Also look for the complete blood count, or CBC, to show a low red blood cell count, hemoglobin level, and hematocrit. These test results reflect reduced erythropoietin production and red blood cell damage by uremic toxins. If your patient undergoes arterial blood gas analysis, expect to find low blood pH and bicarbonate levels. These abnormal levels are caused by the kidney's inability to secrete hydrogen ions and by insufficient bicarbonate reabsorption and production in the body. In a patient with chronic renal failure, urinalysis may detect protein, casts, red blood cells, and low to normal specific gravity. To identify the cause of your patient's renal failure, she may undergo a renal biopsy. In this procedure, the physician inserts a needle into the kidney to remove a small piece of tissue for analysis. The renal biopsy may reveal characteristic tissue changes that confirm the underlying disorder, such as systemic lupus erythematosus or amyloidosis. After chronic renal failure is confirmed, begin your patient's treatment, which usually starts with dietary changes. 
expect to provide a diet that's low in protein, potassium, sodium, and phosphorus. Also plan to restrict your patient's fluid intake to about 500 milliliters more than her daily urine output. To treat anemia, administer recombinant erythropoietin as prescribed. This drug mimics endogenous erythropoietin and increases red blood cell production. To correct hyperkalemia, administer sodium polystyrene sulfonate orally or rectally. This resin absorbs potassium ions through the GI mucosa in exchange for sodium ions. Or administer IV glucose and insulin. This drug combination shifts intravascular potassium into the cells, lowering the blood potassium level. To treat hyperphosphatemia, expect to provide a phosphate binder, such as aluminum hydroxide gel. In the intestines, aluminum hydroxide binds with phosphate to form aluminum phosphate. Because the intestines can't absorb aluminum phosphate, it's excreted in the stool. This lowers the blood phosphate level. Despite these treatments, your patient may develop a life-threatening complication, such as severe fluid overload or hyperkalemia. If so, prepare for hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Your patient with chronic renal failure may need hemodialysis at least three times a week to remove uremic toxins, electrolytes, and excess intravascular fluid. Or she may need peritoneal dialysis. This procedure requires the surgeon to insert a flexible catheter into the peritoneal space. To perform dialysis, infuse a hypertonic dialysate into the peritoneal cavity. Because the peritoneal membrane is semi-permeable, it allows electrolytes and uremic toxins to diffuse into the dialysate. After the prescribed dwell time, remove the dialysate through the catheter. If necessary, prepare your patient with end-stage renal failure for kidney transplantation. In this procedure, the surgeon implants a kidney from a compatible donor into the patient's abdominal cavity. If the transplant is a success, the new kidney takes over the failed kidney's function, which usually prevents the need for dialysis. Whenever you're caring for a patient with acute or chronic renal failure, individualize your nursing care based on the patient's condition but be sure to perform these general nursing interventions. Measure your patient's blood pressure and other vital signs at least once every four hours. Monitor your patient's weight every day to detect any weight gain. Provide a diet that's low in fluid, protein, and potassium and other electrolytes as prescribed and perform skin care and other interventions to reduce distressing symptoms such as pruritus. Before your patient is discharged, be sure to teach her how to manage her disorder at home. Plan to review health maintenance activities such as checking her weight daily, dietary changes such as limiting her fluid and protein intake, dialysis appointments or peritoneal dialysis procedures and drugs including their dosage and frequency as you've just seen any disorder or substance that damages the kidney structures can lead to renal failure and renal failure can upset the fluid and electrolyte balance and disrupt most body functions. Whether your patient has acute or chronic renal failure, you need to understand its pathophysiology. That way you'll know how to identify its signs and symptoms accurately, evaluate its treatment expertly, intervene skillfully to help your patient manage the disorder, and anticipate or prevent its complications. For your patient with renal failure, this knowledge can help you provide the best possible care and can help her lead a fuller 
richer life.